So, okay, uh, welcome to the sixth webinar of our series, 2020, a year without public space under the COVID-19 pandemic. My name is Hendrik Thieben from Chinese University of Hong Kong and with Luisa Bravo from the Journal of Public Space. Uh, we started this uh, series in May and so far have looked at various aspects related to public space under the current conditions. Uh, for instance, we invited guests uh, to discuss about public space and house disparities or public space and informal settlements. And if you missed out one of those sessions, they all uh, are posted on our YouTube channel and through, our, through the Journal of Public Space, you can find all the links and see all our webinars and also later this webinar. Um, every second Thursday of the month, we reserved for discussions about innovative approaches and artistic responses to the pandemic. And in this context, it also was the session for today developed um, by RMIT in Melbourne uh, with the title of Speculative Cities Thinking Forward. Uh, before I give the word to the co-host Luisa Bravo, uh, I just want to mention just some details how you can get uh, engaged with us and in touch uh, during and after the session. So basically we disable the chat function, but uh, you can use the Q&A function of uh, Zoom and send us comments and questions. Um, we will then select some of those questions for the roundtable discussion at the end. Uh, the other questions we will also kind of carefully uh, read and some of them we will also use for later sessions uh, that we are still planning. Um, and uh, also there is usually a exit, um, little exit survey where you can also leave us your comments. Um, you can also get involved by writing us emails and make also suggestions for, for panels. That's basically everything from my part today. And uh, I want to pass the word now to Luisa Bravo from the Journal of Public Space, and she will introduce the theme and also all our speakers for today. Uh, thank you, Hendrik, and uh, welcome uh, everyone, speakers and attendees to this uh, uh, webinar today. As uh, Hendrik mentioned, this is about uh, innovative approaches and creative practices. Uh, and so it's a special series uh, in our initiative. And uh, I'm very glad to have today as uh, co-hosts of this uh, webinar, our MIT CAST, Contemporary Art and Social Transformation Research Group. Um, I just want to say something regarding the collaboration uh, um, with RMIT um, in regard of the Journal of Public Space. Um, this collaboration started uh, back in 2018 uh, while I was uh, in Australia and I actually met uh, this amazing group of people from RMIT and uh, we had uh, an amazing time uh, during seminars uh, and research activities, meetings. Uh, and so after that, uh, the first activity that we jointly developed uh, was uh, a special issue of the Journal of Public Space on uh, art and activism in public space um, with Maggie McCormick uh, from RMIT as co-editor. And later, uh, when we saw that uh, this special issue actually uh, became very, very successful, we decided to start a series as part of the journal on art and activism in public space. So last year, 2019, we had the second issue of this series with Maggie McCormick and uh, Fiona Hillary as uh, co-editors. And currently we are working on the third issue that will be published uh, in November 2020. And we already had a call for papers uh, and we already selected a number of uh, research papers and portfolios that will be published uh, uh, this year. Um, I see that uh, there is a great potential uh, on this uh, topic, uh, art and activism in public space, uh, that is uh, <clears throat> um, um, uh, studying public space from a transdisciplinary approach, uh, putting together research and practice in uh, what I think uh, it is a kind of new and very challenging uh, discipline uh, related to public space. 
Um, so I'm very glad to have the opportunity to continue this collaboration today with this uh, webinar and this, with this amazing group of uh, speakers. Uh, thank you uh, RMIT, thank you Maggie, uh, Fiona and Katrina for organizing this uh, and uh, enjoy this session to all attendees and to all the speakers. Thank you. Thanks Louisa, that's a fabulous yes. introduction. <laughs> Thank you, Fiona. So uh, this is now um, your, uh, um, uh, your time to introduce all the speakers uh, and uh, to introduce all the topics uh, related to, to this webinar. So uh, Fiona Hillary now uh, from RMIT University School of Art. She's the program manager of the, um, uh, this unique master program, Art in Public Space. Thank you, Fiona. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks for joining us today. I'd like to start off by acknowledging um, that I'm coming to you from Melbourne, Australia, and I'd like to acknowledge to, to do an acknowledgement of country. So I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which I'm based today. The Boon Wurrung and Woi Wurrung peoples of the Kulin Nation. I acknowledge the traditional owners of country throughout Australia and recognise their continuing connection to land, waters and culture. I would like to acknowledge that there never has been a treaty. The traditional owners of this land have never ceded their sovereignty. I pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging and acknowledge all First Nations people joining us tonight. Welcome to our webinar, Speculative Cities. For this event, we have presentations from Australia, the United States of America, the Philippines, New Zealand, and Japan via Croatia. I would like to thank Louisa and Hendrik for establishing and curating this fabulous series of talks. And I'd like to uh, introduce my fabulous local collaborators for this presentation tonight. Um, colleagues from RMIT University, Maggie McCormick. Maggie's an adjunct professor in the School of Art, and she's also an honorary professor at Reutlingen University in Germany. And Katrina Simon, who is our Associate Dean of Landscape Architecture in the School of Architecture and Urban Design. Our structure tonight offers two dialogues. The first dialogue focuses on urban, landscape and architectural practice. The second focuses around curatorial and art practice. Each session will be hosted by a chair who will introduce each panel to you. There will then be a respondent reflecting on the presentations in each dialogue. At the end of the presentations, we will engage with the questions that arise from you, the audience. Please, as Hendrik mentioned, write your questions in the chat for our conveners to access and facilitate at the end of the two dialogues. I'll now hand over to Maggie McCormick. Maggie will introduce the topic of our webinar tonight. Thank you. Speculative Cities uh, Thinking Forward explores speculative art and design practice and its impact on public space. This, this mode of thought takes a critical approach to the acquisition of knowledge through practice to contribute to contemporary understanding of the times we live in and will live in. It questions existing paradigms and asks what if and seeks to imagine and create alternative futures. This is particularly relevant in our current times and our post-COVID-19 circumstances. Cities in their responses to the global pandemic have all had different approaches, but all of them have had an immense impact on public space. The everyday multi-layered city rhythms of public space have transformed into patterns of silence, social distancing, and the ever-present action of sanitizing hands. Gradually, as this changes, it's time to reimagine public space and also reclaim its important role in our cities. Pandemics like climate change are highly probable. So they're not random surprises, but they occur after a series of warnings and visible evidence. The evidence is observed by the scientific community, but it's very often ignored by societies. 
Artists and designers who engage in speculative art public space practice play an important role in expanding our capacity to think forward. The speakers and respondents in the two dialogues to follow consider these ideas. The chair for dialogue one, speculative design, urban landscape and architectural practice is Davizi Boonthum, professor in architecture and urban design at Meiji University, Japan, she is visiting professor at the University of Ljubljana, member of the Council Board of City State Architecture and co-founder of Co Plus Ray, a platform for strategic thinking, making and living better cities. As mentioned earlier, Debezi would normally be coming from Tokyo, Japan, but now she joins us from Split in Croatia due to the, the travel impact of COVID-19. Debezi. Handing over to thank you, Maggie. Yeah, thank you, Maggie, and uh, welcome to the first dialogue. Um, in dialogue one, there are two speakers. Um, I'd like to introduce you to first um, Mark Jack um, from Melbourne, Australia. So uh, Mark is a professor of architecture, urbanism, industry fellow, um, architecture and urban design at RMIT University. So he is also the founder of Open Work, um, landscape architecture and urban design practice, um, which undertake the collaborative projects, uh, research and speculation in public space. Uh, the, spe uh, the second speaker is uh, Sarah Fayyad uh, from the United States. Um, her background is in a landscape architect, urban designer, um, obtained her degree from um, GSD Harvard, where she is right now a um, teaching uh, assistant. Um, Sarah combines um, computer science, machine learning, data science, which leads her, um, her work to concentrate on technology. Um, her interest uh, lies um, at urban design and landscape architecture uh, with technology. Um, which um, implemented in various scales in the cities. Uh, she also participated in the Chicago Biennale exhibition in 2019. So um, I'd like to invite um, maybe first uh, Mark Jack to, to start. Uh, uh, sorry, sorry, I'm happy to <laughs> present the respondent of this uh, session. Um, sorry, Katrina, so I, I just hurry up a little bit. Um, the respondent of this session is Katrina Simon from Australia, New Zealand. Um, she's now associate in um, landscape and architecture, School of Architecture and Urban Design at uh, R RMIT Australia. So again, sorry about this. Um, Mark, uh, Mark, if you can uh, start your presentation. Thank you, Debesi. I'd yeah, like to remind you um, that we have about seven to eight minutes um, and you will be interrupted if you go a little bit over time. So, thank you. I'll, I'll do my best to be on time. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, the implication of an event titled A Year Without Public Space is that the nature of public space and the way in which we behave in public space have been changed or suspended irrevocably during the COVID-19 pandemic. I want to open with a statement that somewhat denies that implication. I want to say that for our practice, public space is the negotiation of the private body of the individual in space shared with the other or with the stranger. This negotiation is what constituted public space for us in June 2019, and it's the same negotiation that constitutes public space in June 2020. If anything, the metrics and behaviours of social distancing make this negotiation more immediate and tactile than before COVID conditions arguably increasing the sites of public space rather than removing them. The reason that I say this is that the scales, metric and spatial hierarchies of, uh, that we as designers of uh, public space and design professionals use in determining relationships in public space are now democratised. Everyone knows about them, whether they realise it or not. This is the proxemics diagram a drawing that our studio routinely leans on in the design of its public projects. Proxemics is a term coined by Edward T. Hall in the 1960s and deals with metrics around space, the body, and around social interaction. Um, Hall assigns a series of distances from the personal body with descriptors of social proximity, 
intimate, personal, social and public. What sounds like a culturally specific and archaic kind of measuring is in fact a way of spatialising social distance, the size of a whisper, a shout, the amount of space it takes to read facial expressions, to reach and be touched, the distance before you can't make out a face or the whites of the eyes. And as everyone now knows, the distance of the whisper or the distance of a touch is also the distance of transmission. 1.5 metres has become the unconscious yardstick of registration and of negotiation. A spatial metric that was once invisible has become visible to the point of ubiquity. Bodies in space that were once unseen, easily ignored or gazed through are now encountered, seen and negotiated. Um, I'd say that uh, a broader awareness of the body in space or permission and invitation in public space is a productive byproduct of this pandemic and grows the vocabulary of the citizen in public space rather than diminishing it. And I acknowledge that Australia's relative success in avoiding the worst effects of this virus might cloud this view and that the opinion may not be easily transferable to other jurisdictions. In this context, I'd like to describe a project that we've been working on for the last two weeks. You could call it a COVID-19 project. The client is the financial fund that manages a large office tower in an Australian capital city. With commercial rents and leases under immense pressure from COVID-19, work from home and social distancing practices, the fund is keen to offer the lessees an incentive to return to the office and seek to trans and they seek to transform this unloved light well in the building into a sanctuary garden where people can escape for biophilic isolation. The project that we're working on satisfies this brief, but fulfills its own brief, or what we might call a meta brief, by designing a garden, which might be seen in the fullness of time as a memorial to social distancing. And this is, this is something of a Trojan horse. This is our project that the client doesn't know about. The central figure of the space is filled with plants forming an upper story canopy and a mid-level uh, of ground covers. From this bed of fecundity, a series of small rooms are carved with a seat in their center. So this is a, a section showing that upper story and the seats. The seat is formed from a sliced column, the legacy of an interior fed out from the 1980s that is surplus for the needs of the foyer. The column diameter of around one meter provides enough space for one bottom or with negotiation two bottoms to use at any one time. Around the column seat, we carve a one metre wide path for circulation. The resulting uh, public space is a built diagram of the 1.5 metre COVID-19 distancing metric, the private body at the centre of the space of negotiation. The unseen proxemic measure of the uh, intimate, built forever in stone, steel and wood, and a reminder that public space is the negotiation of the private body of the individual and the space shared with the other. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Um, it's very really brief and short. <laughs> so um, let's move on to the second speaker, Sarah. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Great. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, and thank you for inviting me to be part of this uh, critical conversation. Um, thank you also to the previous speaker, Mark. I think you raised some very interesting points about the spatial implications of the COVID and how we think in this age um, about design. Perhaps this is a good segue into what I'm hoping to shed the light on um, and uh, discuss the idea of public space without space through the lens of technological innovations um, in the age of public health crisis. Just a little bit about myself. My name is Sarah Fayette, and I'm a current researcher in an, and innovation fellow at Harvard University. Um, my work is oriented towards the intersection of urban design, landscape architecture, um, and technology. I recently graduated from the Graduate School of Design, uh, and no, unfortunately, this is not what our graduation ceremony looked like where we usually gather in this um, in Harvard Yard, which is the largest public space on campus. Instead, it looked something more of, um, like this. Friends and family from all over the world came together in this virtual public space. Technology has proven to be a lifeline for the connectivity and keeping us connected. The advantage of this is that it provided an equitable platform for users, where everyone is equal in this virtual space, 
and more people can attend the ceremony who otherwise would not have been able to. However, the disadvantage is it raises broader issues regarding inequality. For example, not everyone has access to technology or knows how to use it. Since the first case of coronavirus was detected mid-November last year, the world has experienced unprecedented changes. As you can see in this graph, the US has been hit the worst globally by the COVID pandemic. To date, there has been more than 1.9 million cases and over 110,000 deaths. This abrupt change and um, restriction is most visible in our public spaces. So beaches, trails, playgrounds, sports fields have all been closed and made inaccessible to public. On the upside though, we've seen major improvements, um, environmental improvements, um, where you can see here in the headlines highlighting the decrease in CO2 levels, as well as air and um, water pollution. Taken only two months apart, uh, before and after the lockdown, these two images show just how much the ozone layer has healed in this time. But despite these closures and restrictions in public spaces, people have still found ways to adapt and be on the outside while maintaining social rest restriction in very creative ways. Technology, again, um, came into the physical world um, Technology again came into the physical world, the public space, to help track and manage the virus spread. But these technological interventions, though proven a great benefit, comes the question, do they make our public spaces less public? 2020, a year without public space under the COVID-19 pandemic. I would like to offer a hypothesis here. It is possible that the COVID-19 crisis may fundamentally change our relationship with the public space. But I would argue that perhaps it's not just about the loss of physical space in the city due to the pandemic. Rather, the, this loss might stem from the introduction of something even perhaps more foreign. The rapid intervention of AI and technological gadgets on our streets and public spaces driven primarily by tech giants. The streets may be empty of people and cars, and ro uh, but robot traffic is certainly up. Drones, dog-like robots, and other forms of AI surveillance once considered part of a fictional world, are now the reality of our public spaces. Headlines um, are also highlighting this blunt reality about the new normal. So more surveillance, less privacy, AI robots, and IOTs. So I'd like to discuss, um, I'd like to focus the conversation on how will technology impact our future public space? And to what extent will it have um, an impact? By technology here, I mean virtual space, artificial intelligence, and surveillance. Public health crises have had a major impact on the way we plan our cities and public spaces for over 100 years. How? For example, in Paris. In the, 19, in the 1800s, a series of cholera pandemics um, ravaged the city and led to the death of about 5% of inhabitants in the city center. Hosman and his chief um, engineer, Belgrand, put together a reconstruction plan of the city's infrastructure, focusing primarily on issues related to sanitation. This ultimately led to the rethinking of current densities and overall urban form by integrating sanitation technology. Though the success of the Hosmanian plan is debatable, the project produced a legacy collaboration between various disciplines and careful integration of technology into the existing urban fabric. In a recent project with Professor Rahul Meritra at Harvard Graduate School of Design, we mapped the patterns of inequality through the lens of public health as part um, of the Chicago Biennale exhibition. This map you see here compiles regions facing water stress, malnutrition, outbreak of cholera and malaria, and location of the world's largest slums. When these different domains are overlaid, and their correlation reinforces um, the inequality that exists between the majority world and the minority world. Focusing on India, we then map mapped all the major pandemics over the past 200 years and their corresponding deaths. It just puts us in perspective that we have been there before. So how can we address issues in public health in, um, in our agency as designers and planners and landscape architects? Mumbai, a city of 18 million people presents a case study that highlights these crises through extreme cases of lack of sanitation and access to basic infrastructure. 
It is a city that has some of the world's highest real estate looking over some over large expenses of slums and informal communities. Access to clean water and sanitation infrastructure is also one of the major issues facing these communities. Somehow though, regardless of their living conditions, they all have, had, have access to some sort of technologies such as phone and tablets to keep them connected. In this project, we focus on, um, sorry, for some reason my um, video is not working here, but um, hopefully we can catch it. So, um, let's see, is this, sorry. Okay. So in this project, we focus on some of the most vulnerable communities known as the Kaliwadas, an indigenous fishing village. Public space is where all the daily activities took place. From cleaning the fish um, to hosting their weddings, it is what knits the community together to reinforce a strong sense of identity and economy. This is snapshots of the video for some reason, it's not loading up. So these informal communities are usually located either near, um, next to a major railway corridor or next to um, the water. Today, due to development pressures, um, they are being forced out of their land and into slums. By examining these, uh, the, the patterns of thriving and shrinking indigenous villages, we discovered that having robust access to water and sanitation and productive landscapes was directly linked to their livelihood. So through acupuncture urbanism, Community-based water management systems in the form of infrastructure and landscape were introduced at different scales throughout the village. Instead of reconstructing the entire village, the urban fabric was reorganized around the integration of smart sanitation and productive landscapes. Urban economics modeling was later developed to quantify the proposed infrastructure, which was um, designed to clean, manage, and extract and sell fresh water. Through this system, um, you can see uh, that uh, the village yearly income tripled uh, by capitalizing on the different forms of extraction. By integrating sanitation technology into the urban fabric, rather than just placing it on the public space, creates not only the opportunity to diversify the community's shrinking landscape-based economy, in this case, it was the fishing, but also contribute to the overall livelihood. This research and work um, culminated in an exhibition at the 2019 Chicago Biennale titled uh, Sanitation and Equity. And lastly, uh, we are currently working on finalizing a book focusing on public health and the role of design. This is a product of over a year of extensive research and data collection. So hopefully it should be published in the next couple of months or so, so please stay tuned. To conclude, I would reiterate the central question to my presentation as a way of in instigating further discussions. In the age of global crisis, how can we use our agency as designers and collaborate with other disciplines like engineering and technology to ensure a safe and equitable future for our public spaces? Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Um, I'll give the floor to Katrina, um, our respondent of this session, to um, raise the question and draw back. <laughs> Um, the speaker to discuss on um, especially on COVID-19. Thank you. Thank you, Davisi, and thank you, Mark and Sarah. I thought that was a, a really wonderful example of the extreme um, range of landscape architecture as a discipline to kind of engage with time and space from you know the intimate space of a, of a, a human uh, in the public realm uh, right out to flows of uh, events through the world. And clearly we're in a remarkable situation now where um, you know talk about the relationship between uh, the global and the local is very present in um, every life so perhaps just to start mark the thing that intrigued me about your um, case study was uh, one thing that occurred to me when i first went outside after we had all been kind of sent home and i saw people uh, queuing at a distance for coffee and what in this environment in, uh, in Melbourne seemed very unusual, certainly atypical, but it did strike me that in many ways it was a little bit like waiting for a bus in Wellington in New Zealand where frequently people are, partly for the wind and just sort of a general spatial um, availability, tend to stand further apart anyway. And it did strike me there's something really interesting about these sort of universalizing diagrams that become, um, you know, 
placed through our landscapes and start to determine certain things. So I'd be interested to hear about your thoughts on that diagram, having now used it in an intriguing way in this um, uh, speculative and soon to be, I think, real project. Um, thank you, thank you, Katrina. I mean, the, uh, I, we used to use the Edward Hall stuff um, uh, almost secretly. We'd pass it under the table to one another because we were sort of, it has a sort of strange um, air about it. It's almost, um, it's, it's almost sort of edging toward a kind of spatial frenetics where, um, uh, but I think if you think about it, in reverse, not that it's a totalizing diagram, but it's a diagram that registers um, physical metrics and physical facts. It becomes something relatively um, compelling. It becomes a it becomes a tool, and in this instance, that idea of the space of the intimate really does become uh, a metric around how far the voice can be projected at a whisper, um, and it uh, regrettably or or coincidentally. Uh, coincides with the 1.5 metre exclusion zone for physical touching. Um, and I guess the, the thing that I'm interested in um, about that, particularly with the notion of proxemics, which if you look at bigger scales in terms of public space and social space, really do to begin to describe um, the kind of perfect metric of uh, ideal town squares, et cetera, where uh, the other can be encountered at the opposite end of the space and still be seen and identified. It's a kind of lizard brain function of uh, uh, fright or flight. Um, the, the thing I'm interested in, I suppose, is that in our normal experience of the city, uh, there are a whole series of tactics of design, uh, tactics of inclusion and tactics of exclusion that are often wielded by design professionals um, or uh, people who police public space or people who are policy makers in public space that are essentially um, ways of to include or exclude particular behaviours in that space. Um, proxemics can be used or spatial uh, metrics can be used as one of those tactics. And I guess the hope is that by democratising or making one of these spatial metrics explicit, um, uh, people might have a greater understanding about behaviours, permission and invitation in, in public space. That one of the, you know, one of the byproducts of this um, sort of horrific uh, event might be that if people can see the way that social um, uh, relationships are orchestrated in space, they may be able to use those tactics uh, to create different behaviours either for themselves or others in space. Um, so I think that that diagram is a, is a relatively benign uh, example of some kind of behaviour that I hope changes uh, as a result of this pandemic. I think, Sarah, there's a really interesting resonance with the, you know, the way you took us through this sort of um, global appreciation for um, the impact of um, pandemics uh, on space, but also then the, the positive and negative, uh, but ultimately in the way that you're using, um, seeing the potential uses for technology in being able to reconstruct and retrofit um, uh, these communities that you were talking about right at the end. And I think in a way that the, uh, the approach to seeing sanitation, again, is something that's usually uh, invisible or, or not necessarily seen as a, as a social um, agent actually being able to make that into something that actually itself uh, creates social relationships or, or makes them possible. Um, and that, that again struck me as a really interesting, I guess, twist on the um, on the first specter of, of technology that you that you showed us. Yeah, I mean, sanitation is always like an invisible infrastructure, isn't it? It's kind of like something that we've become so, um, it becomes so normalized to us, but once upon a time, there were some pandemics that happen as a result of lack of sanitation, just the same way that we're still seeing them these days. And the way that we've adapted to them in the past is that we've demolished and reconfigured our spaces. Um, again, we rethought about densities, we rethought about, you know, the same questions that we're experiencing now, but it will be interesting to go back in time, I think, to understand, this is part of the timeline that I showed, 
that we have been there before and there has been even greater deaths um, that resulted from previous pandemics, health pandemics. So it'll be interesting to see in this world that we space, um, you know, sort of buildings or um, even like in urban places, we can still work from home, we can work remotely. The internet is so engraved into our daily lives. How would that change the future of our cities? You, we might not have to necessarily demolish and rebuild. Um, it, might necessarily, it might just be um, sort of an idea of retrofitting or rethinking space through some virtual space. And it just makes us wonder like, would this, would this, would the virtual space ever replace our um, uh, physical space? You know, um, and this comes back to this idea of public space without space. Um, so just kind of like, a, um, you know, some, um, you know, patterns that we've seen in the past and how we can respond to them hopefully in the future. I think that issue of the the voice uh, was sort of, I guess, a couple of things, but the uh, the notion of the voice and proximity that, that Mark raised that's really implied in that diagram is also really interesting because I think, you know, as you mentioned, these sort of ubiquitous technologies that basically you can speak to anyone pretty much from anywhere. We've got people on the screen and in the audience from, from all around the world. And so in a way it does collapse that distinction of, um, you know, people being far and less, less audible. But I think, so that to me also strikes me as a, um, a sort of curious inversion and how that may be something else that then distinguishes a particular character of, of spaces and interactions where you do get that um, differential again. So rather than everything being always audible and always accessible, that mm. it, in a sense becomes that ability to change that dynamic really becomes um, of heightened sensibility. I don't know if either of you have any thoughts on that. <laughs> I was also, I guess, thinking about it too, because one thing that I'm really conscious of, you know, reading about how, you know, this sort of almost fear of singing at the moment, singing seems to have become a, an activity that potentially accelerates transition, um, a transmission, and, and um, that just seems like a, a, a sad thing. And I keep thinking, well, maybe everyone could hum for a while because that at least would be a little safer. <laughs> yeah. Can... Sorry, Mike, please go ahead. Oh, no, no, I was going to say something frivolous about uh, humming. Um, no, Sarah, you go. No, I think um, just a little bit as well on the, um, you know, how we're also changing um, sort of this, the distancing and how, you know, maybe perhaps even this diagram could even go up to the virtual spaces around the world and what does that mean? Um, but the in the case of um, Mumbai, for example, it presented sort of like extreme cases of what sanitation means or what, what we're experiencing, but even on extreme sort of um, cases because a lot of these communities are actually incapable of, um, you know, uh, keeping social distancing because they're very closely knitted. Um, so it kind of like, it also raises, although like there's so many benefits, we've seen so many benefits with technology, but really it does highlight this idea of inequality um, that we're seeing and that it's kind of underlying a lot um, around the world. And, you know, some people might have access to uh, internet and others might not, or technological um, gadgets and so forth. Um, and, yeah, I guess it's just a... Sorry, is that... Can you still hear me? Yes. Yeah. Oh, yes. Sorry. yes. You just gave me an error. Um, yeah. <laughs> I think that um, the point that you raised, Sarah, about um, the potential or the possibility of public space without space is an interesting one. And I don't know whether we'll necessarily extinguish that in this session, but it would be a good one to reflect on in some of the future ones. I mean, I think um, there's a sense for me, uh, you know, after whatever it is, eight weeks of engaging with the world through this kind of forum, that um, uh, you know, the, I, I guess the sort of ex the notion of exchange and negotiation that I'm interested in, uh, you know, Zoom and Microsoft Teams, etc., is a kind of you know a very sort of prophylactic version of that exchange. So there's always the nature of the screen that seems to be sort of impenetrable. Um, and uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure. I suppose that the idea of the virtual space carries as a proxy for public space in the way that I think about public space. Um, and, uh, you know, the test here is that if uh, we were to have a disagreement or there were to be um, some 
difficulty that needed to be negotiated, I could, you know, turn off the monitor. Uh, I, could, you know, I could choose to not deal with it. In that sense, this becomes a kind of social media version of um, public space where if I don't like something, I don't have to contend with it. I can cancel it and go about my merry way. Um, so, I, I, you know, I sort of acknowledged that there's a dimension to that, but I, um, I'm sort of, you know, sort of, uh, I'm repentantly old fashioned in that regard. I think that uh, the virtual realm is an adjunct to the public space, but um, uh, an adjunct to the public realm, but uh, isn't uh, a replacement for it, I suppose. I, I totally agree. And I think, um, I mean, even like having this discussion, it kind of, um, I did one of the, the classes that I did and it was, um, there was a transition from being in class and there was so much energy in class. It's yeah. so much collaboration. There was so yeah. much, you know, you, you don't have to mute yourself. You can just kind of respond um, uh, spontaneously. You don't have to kind of yeah. you just unmute and make an intention and then cut off the other person. There's kind of the overlapping of faces, even if this interface doesn't allow you to. Mm. Um, so I, I absolutely agree. And I think also the emotions are never displayed um, correctly mm. through this virtual space. But what it does is that somehow, even if you think about the physical space, if you're talking, let's just say we're sitting on a table and there's people all over the table. Um, mm. Somehow where you're located, usually you can hear the speaker a little bit more. You can engage with mm. the speaker. But on this platform, I'm looking at you um, and everyone else, um, mm. even the attendees and the participants, we're all mm. having this sort of um, equal space um, mm. in, the, in, this, in this world. So there is benefits in this. There is also, um, yeah, a huge, a huge um, concerns with it. Um, mm. Because also just imagine if one of these, uh, if you're sitting in a public space and these AI robots, um, one of the, these dog-like um, robots come up to you and say, sorry, you're not um, complying with the social distancing and regulations. Can you put your mask on? And you just came in for a breather. So mm -hmm. it just kind of makes you think with all the surveillance that's going onto the streets, it's going to ultimately push us out of this roads because we're constantly going to feel that we're, going, we're being chased, we're being watched. So it makes this whole idea of a public space less public um, through the eyes of all these um, interventions and you know, Big Brother watching. Mm -hmm. um, so, and I think it just comes to us as designers, how can we collaborate with engineers, um, uh, technology, uh, the, the technology industry, and join hands to kind of integrate some of these aspects into a more design oriented way, just in the same way that we've integrated sort of sanitation. So instead of placing it in the public space, we can integrate it more um, around, um, you know, the needs of the community. Um, and, and in a more design-oriented way, just in the same as the Hosmanian plan, um, where they, the infrastructure was integrated into the urban fabric or the projects that are presented. Can I just ask um, you both if the you know, recent experiences over the last couple of months, um, both the ones you've experienced yourself and also those that you've had relayed to you through the media or through various uh, virtual forms have actually fundamentally changed your sense um, of what your speculative practice might involve? Do you think it's actually given it a new dimension or it's really strengthened your belief in certain things that need to be pr protected or has there any been any significant change, do you think? I can, I can jump in. Yeah. I think uh, for me, it has certainly um, strengthened my belief in the importance of being outside and connecting physically with the people. Um, and it highlighted the dangers of all of these gadgets and allowing um, tech giants to take over the lead and, um, and take over our public spaces. Um, and it kind of also braced this urgency for us as designers to join hands with them and find out ways that we can uh, be part of this whole move, the cognitive era, if they want to call it that way. So it certainly did... Um, strengthen my belief in the importance of um, being outside and connecting with people and being in the physical space rather than just because um, next thing you know we're, we end up in an avatar or something in a mm. bed. I think actually my um, answer is almost perfectly complementary to that in that um, uh, you know however many stages of grief there are there are several stages of adapting to this thing the first stage was a kind of sleeplessness 
uh, and a perpetual need to work, sort of financial um, office imperative to kind of keep keep work going through the door. But um, immediately after that, there was a very strange period of a couple of weeks where I would almost not make any drawings or phone calls, but I was just constantly making models, just sort of um, just need to 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 make and uh, off to the left hand side of my home office. Um, all the, all the models are there in a sort of state of semi-completion. Um, so I think there was a sort of um, impulse to compensate for the lack of tactile engagement and the lack of physicality that was about uh, not being in the city and not working with people and to push that into some other process. Model making forms an enormously large part of our work anyway, um, but there was a sort of profound overcompensation, which seems to me to confirm the fact that um, uh, uh, the, the tactile dimension, the physical dimension to the work is innate and in some ways is its engine. Um, so yeah, this whole process has, um, uh, I probably confirmed confirmed that as, as the primary focus of the whole enterprise. So back, back well, I love that concept of the, the innate engine. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> So I think we're, I think our time for conversation um, has reached its end, but I will um, just like to thank both of you for that, um, you know, those presentations and really great insights into a working, you know, working practices, which are inherently diverse, but you know, have strong, I think, um, similarities in terms of things that have become heightened as important um, for designers. Um, obviously design practices enormously varied. Um, Devisi, I don't know if you want to, draw that to a conclusion or? Yeah, I think we have a little bit of time, isn't it, um, uh, Fiona? So can we, sh we should invite maybe uh, other participants, I mean, you know, um, from the floor to maybe join in for questions. Is it now or maybe at the end of the so whole session? The intention is to save the Q&A from the audience till the end okay. after the next dialogue so that maybe there'll be some um, connection between the two. Mm. Okay. okay, right. So maybe, yeah. So okay. I think time's is up. We can just move on yeah. to the second dialogue. Yeah. Thank sure. you. Yeah. Thank you very yeah. much for uh, the two speakers and also the respondents, uh, Katrina. So um, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I'd like to introduce the speakers in the second dialogue, which is on speculative curatorial and art practice. So we have Emily Sexton from Australia, who is a cross-disciplinary curator, festival director, and artistic director for the Arts House Melbourne, and convener of the Refugee Talk Series. We also have Andre Nikolai Pamintuan from the Philippines, who is an independent producer and director engaging with communities through the arts and creative innovation. He's also the creative, creative director of Pineapple Lab. And the third speaker will be Sophie Jerram from New Zealand, who is an artist and curator working through letting space and urban dream brokerage in response to post earthquake conditions. And the respondent for these three speakers is uh, Devisi. So thank you for um, acting in that role. So Emily, I'd like you to invite you to share your screen <laughs> and your thoughts. My internet has just gone on uh, a bit unstable. Is everyone okay to hear me? Is that fine? Yes. Yep. We're good? Okay, great. Hopefully it sticks with us. Um, so before um, I start sharing the screen, I just wanted to, I guess, build on something actually that um, the two previous speakers had shared, which was to broaden our definition of public space from the streets solely. Um, so I work inside an old uh, town hall, um, a converted um, town hall in North Melbourne in, um, that uh, is now a very flexible multidisciplinary art space that artists love to be in once they're there, and I'll get to that later. Um, but I, I wanted to propose that any civic institution of that kind should be seen as public space and um, a site that's open for debate and should be held and is held to account by its citizens or in my council land ratepayers. Um, 
And I think that's really important to hold because of my second point about public space, which bounces off something that um, Mark said, which is that the internet and social media are a form of public space uh, in 2020, space wholly owned by private interests. So a civic town hall, like where I work, um, or indeed a recreation centre, a pool, a gallery, a museum, any of those spaces that are sort of government driven um, are, are really crucial for if we're going to contest ideas, enact any kind of activism. Um, and uh, so I, I wanted to share that because as a curator, um, and I'm experiencing it on an everyday level, I think it's important to consider what that practice looks like inside the institution. And this goes beyond and within COVID-19. I'm definitely um, building upon some thoughts that um, Clotilde Berlin um, from the MCA, who's a curator there, um, shared as part of, um, um, I'm forgetting the, the symposium, but it was held at MAMA um, late last year on public space. and. I'm, I'm really saying that curatorial practice inside an institution does look like uh, facilitation, collaboration, and institutional activism. It means um, doing the work that I think uh, any responsible contemporary arts organisation should be doing at the moment, which is thinking through ways to disperse power and decision making. Um, now, a massive institution uses hierarchy to mitigate risk. So to disperse power like that is, is potentially uncomfortable for a big institution. And I think um, one of the more important areas of work we're doing at the moment is to find new systems um, or um, different methods of cultural governance over our work. And that is absolutely about First Nations people, but it is also about representation that the community expects for artists with a disability. Um, for people with co of colour. So I guess I wanted to just offer a few of those framing um, contexts at the beginning of this discussion um, as a way into a couple of projects that I wanted and to talk about. Um, my screen now. So the first is Refuge. Um, we've been doing Refuge since uh, 2015 and the project imagines a space where the crisis has already occurred and um, thinks through how would we, we would respond. Um, in the first year we looked at floods, um, uh, the second year we looked at heat and in 2018 we worked with the Doherty Institute as part of the University of Melbourne to look at pandemics. So, um, and then in 2019, we looked at um, displacement. It's um, an incredibly weird experience when your speculative project becomes um, absolutely a daily reality. And so a lot of the things that um, we were engaged with as part of a broader community preparedness project um, and work and, in, and worked very closely with um, some of the um, people in uniform that you can see in this image, um, our state emergency service, the Red Cross, and also our internal emergency management colleagues at City of Melbourne. A lot of the language and a lot of the thinking that inside Refuge is now very explicit as across the world. Um, uh, things like in a crisis, it's um, people at the margins who are made, already made more vulnerable. Things like um, uh, when, um, uh, yeah, the, the strength, the, re, the pre existing strength of a community um, is what will allow a better response um, when that community is under pressure. And that's why emergency services and, and why we've worked so closely with them to, to look at community preparedness and, and the Red Cross's Know Your Neighbour campaigns. And they're very um, modest, I guess, in their thinking and also trying really emergency services more generally as. The more um, some of the partners we've worked with are trying very hard to move out of what they know um, isn't going to work for us in the future, which is a control and command, control and command uh, approach. So Refuge has become um, a, a space in which these kinds of discussions can be had across disciplines between artists and we've had the same core group of artists involved um, with some additional um, people coming in along the way. Um, since 2015. 
And uh, yeah, so the, those conversations can be had between artists, between emergency services, between scientists. And there was a lot of playing in the dark, um, which was incredibly useful. Um, what has been most um, fascinating um, about having done that work with those um, collaborators, um, and there's probably a number in about, there's probably 80 to 100 people that have been involved in Refuge since 2015 as what I would consider core collaborators, um, is when we put together a recent series of, that you can um, go back and have a look at, it's, um, as um, was mentioned, the Refuge Live Talk series, what's become really evident is that the artists involved um, in this work are uniquely prepared for living through and adapting to crisis like COVID-19. So um, it says to me that speculative and imaginative work actually is um, resilience building and, and incredibly um, useful to, to sort of prepare people for what happens. Um, we were actually meant to do our main lab um, on uh, yeah, that brings together 80 people across the disciplines. We were meant to do that on the day that our building got closed. So um, it, it was quite curious to me that in that quite crazy environment of, of immediate flux and change, it was these artists that really that were quite centred and, and less, um, less disrupted, I guess, uh, emotionally and mentally than um, many of the other artists that I'm working with on a day level. Um, the other thing that I wanted to note about Refuge in particular, and you'll see this if you um, go and have a look at our website um, and recent talks, is that um, perhaps the most strongest theme that's emerged over time is the importance of embedding First Nations wisdom as part of community preparedness. And um, yes, the outcomes of Refuge uh, at times include um, uh, yeah, artistic projects of a range of forms um, and dinners like this and talks and discussion, I guess events like the arts normally does. But a big part of the project is also um, speaking in forums where we are not normal, art, the arts aren't normally seen and in particular where First Nations people aren't normally seen. So. Um, that's been a lot of the work is just continued presence and explaining the value of creativity um, in, in an emergency management context. Everyone's very open to it, but it, it's about um, that, I guess, continued advocacy. Um, the second project I wanted to share with you is about to open next week. Sorry, I'm just... No, you're just on eight minutes. Oh, wow. Okay. <laughs> Um, all right, very quickly, I'll run through my, the second project, which is a, um, a, a, something we conceived to explore the digital and the live um, uh, well before COVID-19 occurred and it, all sorts of arts discussions were taking place online. Um, so this will launch on the 22nd of June, um, head on over. But I think one of the things that I um, wanted to make a point about was raised by Mark as well, which is the idea of virtual co-presence and the, um, the sense that even when we're um, well before we were what, you know, sitting at home in isolation, we were sharing an experiences together, but via our phones or other kinds of technologies. And I think that, um, that term virtual co-presence is, is quite beautiful. Um, the last thing I just wanted to quickly um, mention is, um, I guess a more broad note on the nature of theatres as a public space and the lack of the complete commercial unviability of, of being in a, um, uh, yeah, a, a theatre that operates with 50% or 70% or capacity because you're trying to keep social distancing. Um, that is one issue that's sort of being played out politically at the moment and in all sorts of other places. But I, um, I wanted to talk just as much about when you are trying to expand um, the kinds of people that are interested in the arts or, or, or feel like they're valued or part of or relevant to a conversation for the arts, um, most of the time you do that one by one. You do that to invite someone very specific um, who is a leader within their community into your space and you try to provide welcome to them. And it is a huge, 
and for my building in particular, it's a huge imposing colonial northern town hall. So it's really intimidating for certain parts of the community. Um, I, the writing welcome to, to people from all who might be intimidated by that space is a crucial part of what we do. And it's made a lot more challenging by um, the kinds of restrictions that we'll, we'll see when, when really, to be safe, we should be meeting in this way um, rather than inviting people into our building all the time. So, um, and, and likewise, the way we share food or all the different parts of how we make people feel at home in our house um, are, are really challenged. So, and for that reason, I guess that's, that's I guess, to circle back why technological tools are going to be required to really be pushed as, as the potential source of, of ways that we can think through those kinds of welcoming activities. And that's it. Thanks, Emily. Thank you for that um, um, description of your work and some reflections on yeah, the particular challenges. And I think yeah, it's extraordinary to have been in that experience of having almost um, experienced the pandemic um, before it happened. Um, and I think your point about people being uh, that speculative and imaginative work does actually prepare people. I think that's a really important point that it actually is a way of rehearsing what might happen and, and therefore being able to deal with it in a different way. So thank you for that. Um, I'd now like to invite uh, Andre to um, present. Thank you. Thank you so much, Katrina. Well, let me just set this up. Um, so I'm going to, um, sorry, technology, using my phone and sharing my screen. Okay. Uh, second. Can you guys see my screen? Can you guys yes. see it? Yes, okay. it's but it, yep, perfect. Thank you. All right. So um, yes, my name is Andre Nicolai Pamantuan. I'm from the Philippines, uh, based here in Makati City. Uh, I'm a theater director and an independent producer. Um, I, I just to give context of where I coming, uh, where I come from, and what I do. Um, I founded the Fringe Manila Festival, which is a multi art um, open access festival, um, and it inaugurated in the Philippines in 2015. Um, I also run uh, an independent art space or creative hub called Pineapple Lab, uh, which has been a gathering space for creatives and artists uh, to showcase and create works uh, that may be considered unconventional, um, experimental, weird, political, uh, whatever have you. Um, and in many ways, it had become a year-round space uh, for artists that are part of the Finch Manila Network who otherwise would not have a home or space to develop their works and cultivate new audiences. So it's become a family. Uh, and we really consider Pineapple Lab a platform and safe space for emerging artists, artists who are women, artists who are part of the LGBTQIA community, um, for them to be able to express themselves and increase their visibility um, through the works that they do. Um, so throughout the year, we curate exhibitions, um, organize gatherings, and produce performances um, at our space. Um, so as you can imagine, like many creatives or those um, in the, the arts and cultural sector, uh, Pineapple Lab and Fringe have been heavily affected um, and have had to close. Um, and and, and as, a, as a community, we thrive in our relationship with each other, whether you're a performer, um, 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 and, a, and an audience member. So it's really that energy um, that kind of we've been missing throughout this, I think here in the Philippines, um, what we call a, a community quarantine for the past three months already. Um, so, so I just wanna talk about our work beyond the space. Um, our work at Pineapple Lab extends beyond the four walls. Um, we work throughout our neighborhood, which is called Bashan. Um, I'm just gonna play this uh, as I speak. Um, we work throughout our neighborhood of Poblacion, which was established 350 years ago. Um, with and so it has such a unique history. Um, however, not a lot of people are aware of this and often come here just for the nightlife. And so it was important for us um, to activate existing public spaces. Um, 
existing public spaces um, through uh, murals, installations, theater performances, uh, workshops, gigs, concerts, and exhibitions. And we wanted to um, highlight the history and DNA of our neighborhood juxtaposed with urban creativity, creativity in public spaces, um, and making art accessible and tangible um, to our communities. Um, however, public spaces in the Philippines are underutilized and uh, a lot of them are inaccessible um, compared to other countries, like, let's say like Australia or the United States. Um, here in the Philippines, you can't even like put your feet on the grass because you're not allowed to do that. There's not even sidewalks. Um, th there, th there are spaces that look like public spaces, but you can't even go there because it's privately owned and you can't even set up a blanket to have a picnic. Um, so, so those are, I guess, the, what, the, the bigger challenges of what public spaces are here in the Philippines. Um, you, there, you can find them, but it's problematic because you don't even have access to them. Um, um, malls have become this sort of uh, public space or alternative to public spaces. Um, however, independent spaces, um, you know, like Pineapple Lab, like Green Papaya, um, like uh, spaces that are run by uh, organizations like Sifat Lawi, for example, have become gathering spaces for artists um, and audiences uh, to, to bring the community together and experience art together. Um, and so I think for me, what's important um, to push for um, is to reimagine the public space as a creative space uh, for artists to be able to continue to showcase their work um, and or include audiences uh, or communities in the process of creating. Um, and even with uh, physical distancing, uh, art or artistic practices and expression doesn't have to hibernate, I feel. It has to be part of the day-to-day -day and public spaces are, are a perfect canvas for that. Um, the return of the public space, at least in my context here in my neighborhood, is claiming and recognizing the power it has to rebuild communities isolated from one another. Um, it may be a live painting uh, of a mural, a participatory community art uh, installation, or a solo performance, all of which can be experienced collectively by the, by the public while observing uh, new normal protocols. Um, here in the Philippines, I'm interested in activating more public spaces and shared spaces to counter the prognosis that performances and gigs are dead at least uh, until uh, late 2020 or mid 2021, I think we must realize that there is life outside um, uh, the walls of institutions, museums, and galleries, and theaters. Hello. Thanks, Andre. And I, um... It's just a really beautiful insight into uh, a very different um, world. I think this, again, the sort of idea that so many, that, that performance um, has been um, so enormously affected um, is still quite hard to grapple with really. Um, so um, I think, yeah, recognizing that and how different uh, communities and practitioners are dealing with it is really, uh, really, really interesting. So I think in a probably a related vein in some ways, um, Sophie, I'd like to invite you to jump on. <laughs> Kia ora. Thanks so much, Katrina. Kia ora koutou. Um, my name is Sophie Jerem. I, uh, I identify as Pākehā, meaning white settler New Zealander. Um, and yeah, it's, it's, I'm talking to you today from, I guess, my own community space called the Vogelmorn Bowling Club, which I'm, I'm going to come to um, later today. It's been really good to see Emily Andre's work and, and it gives, I think we're kind of in a similar vein, potentially. So I want to take us back to, I'm going to try and share the screen, take us back to 2008, which was the time of the last global crisis. Um, let me just play this. <clears throat> Is that working? 
this is this yes. is um, yeah, the range of the some of the work that under the guys letting space which i founded with um my artistic partner mark amory um we've been doing for the last 10 years and so under the it was it was the last financial crisis of 2008 that brought um a, i guess a plethora of vacancies in the city um of wellington as they did in many places around the world so there were many many uh yeah, many shops were emptied out and uh, the financial crisis meant that that, that many people were would, um, were no longer visible. So we decided to actively. I've been working in the business sector actually, and decided that it was much more interesting to have visibility of alternative communities and artists inside the city. So alongside the city council and the arts council, we commissioned numbers of artistic projects that occupied empty um, space, both municipal space but also private space. Uh, that was just a context in case you um, were wondering how we managed to keep the COVID virus at bay, a lot of water in between New Zealand and the rest of the world. Um, <laughs> anyway, so this is one of the pro early projects that Letting Space um, worked with an artist Kim Patton to essentially track the waste food from supermarkets um, and what is not, a, not an uncommon project now in many places around the world, but at the time it was a, it was a first of quite strong um, social practice for New Zealand, whereby uh, she designed a store to look very much like a retail store. Um, and we occupied the site thanks to the property owner who was willing to let us have it temporarily. And, um, we gave then the food away in a, in, a, in a sense that wasn't like a food bank, there was no charity involved, it was very much about a transaction because she wanted to recognize the, the waste of um, the waste of food as well as the for us the kind of wasted space. So this was a project that yeah was a strong strong and continued on around the country for several um, months afterwards but I'm not going to go too deeply into these projects just to give you a taste of what was achieved. Um, a couple of years later, we were working not just with empty shops, but with whole buildings because there were still the, the vacancies were still large. We um, took over this entire building that was set up from Colin Hodgson's work with a data feed from the stock market, and it would the lights would flicker on and off according to the the, the stock market's um, activity that day. So again, using buildings as 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 I suppose um, public space sculptures, public sculptures. Another project we did in the city of Porirua um, was the transitional economic zone of Aotearoa. And this is a performance artist, Mark Harvey, working with community in, in what was a pretty abandoned um, urban center in Porirua. So again, using art playfully, humorously um, to speculate on what could be the future of these places, but also to notice the communities that were already existing um, in these cities that perhaps might not have been so visible before because we've had many years of, of quite a market focus. Um, so I'm just going to flick to, yeah, Steve Fierstad, who Steve's online, I think, with us tonight. She developed a beautiful project, took us over a year to talk to community about how they might use a park. It was a bit of a no man's land. So this is definitely a space controlled by the municipality of, of um, Wellington. And it was a play, it was a, a huge, beautiful um, painting, but the data that she gained from the community, we, we spent a while getting to know the community and she then painted these into, into these abstractions through bar graphs and pie charts. Um, there's a, a part of a festival. We, we're allowing the, the, the community to become producers of their own space. Um, the yeah what we found i suppose what we were doing was was not just repurposing the space but actually renegotiating authority um temporarily and so we began to use this this term commoning or commons because our intention was to kind of shift control temporarily not just shift the space um and i find that um, i've been working with uh, through the university of copenhagen and victoria universities in wellington i'm also studying towards a PhD and 
architect Stavros Stavridis talks very well about what the difference is between public space and common space. Um, and he's really, I suppose, just pointing towards the fact that public space is always a product of a certain authority. So there's always a condition um, the which forms and habits can be are explored. Whereas common space is a, is, is a, is a difficult but constant challenge um, to the dominant enclaves. Um, and I think that, yeah, it, it's probably true to, to say that for many of my Maori colleagues, the idea of public space is, is, is controversial. Um, in New Zealand, Many sites are called public, but they probably have a deep history that have, have, have had a, other stories, and we at the moment prioritise um, that of the Pākehā settler. Um, for example, this is a, a recent uh, land occupation and, and very important uh, movement. That's um, Ihumato in the, far, in the north, just south of, south of Auckland. Um, this this is a, yeah, has brought together these discussions about whose right it is to sell and develop land. This, these even on space that might be considered public. So who defines who's public is a big part of, um, this isn't an artwork, but this is very much a, a, a constant discussion. So of course it influences our, our artwork. The, um, I just wanted to talk about what does this mean in the time of COVID? And um, one of the things that's interesting that has been distinct, I think for New Zealand is that many Maori um, feeling quite vulnerable to the virus um, on the east coast of the North Island, but also some of Taranaki and in the far north have actually started taking control of their roads to, well, they did, we've now kind of freed, we're freed from the COVID, but um, essentially they started to take control of their roads, stop people coming into their territories because many in the cities and um, were escaping to the country and thinking it would be nice to have a little holiday. So, this was quite a powerful um, series of actions. They're peaceful and, and very well um, managed. Um, my colleague, oops, no, my colleague Rebecca Kittle has sent me, sorry, I'm trying to find the, where's it gone? There's a video, maybe, maybe videos are not gonna work on this tonight. Um, where's it gone? No, it's just not helping me, not letting me do it. Oh, here we are. There's a video which shows, it's a bit of fun to show one of, um, one of the communities. Here we are. Can you see that? It's a TikTok. Hey. You can't hear it. Ah. Oh, what a can shame. Hear it. We can't oh, see it. You couldn't see it? Interesting. Okay. Well, that's a shame. Anyway, look, it's a it's a TikTok video which is using, you know, the, the fun of TikTok, but actually you know, with people who are seriously occupying the, the streets and um, the the roads. Okay, let's go back to this resuming the share. Sorry about In that. Nine minutes, Sophie. Okay, I'll, I'm almost there. I just wanted to say back, back, in the, back in the cities, one of the effects, interestingly, in the last week that's occurred um, as a result of uh, not uh, having eradicated the virus is that there's been a, an anti-cycling um, brigade trying to actually use the, the lack of the virus to prevent temporary cycle lanes which have been obviously implemented all over the world but they've, they've used this as an excuse not to roll those out so there's been some interesting effects of having eradicated the virus so um that's just an aside but i just wanted to say i guess in, in concert with our maori colleagues um one of my, my one of our thoughts has been that sometimes it's very hard to access conditions of authority so i've similarly to Emily's work, I guess we've begun to work with more permanent rather than speculative projects. And this is the Vogelmorn precinct. On the other side of that green is the hall, which was about to be sold by a very um, a sort of hungry council 
a property manager a few years back and the community rallied around that and said, no, no, we wanna keep that for the community. And then on the other side of the green, this bowling club, which has now been bought by the community, many of us artists and filmmakers and, and so on, but the idea being that actually this is, this is a site for sharing. So we've moved from rather speculative practice towards more, temp more permanent, um, still keeping on with speculative, but I do think that we have to start in a way stepping into the conditions that we want to con see continue to be performed. So, um, and just to, I threw this one in just to kind of sort of, you know, echo what Emily was talking about with dinners. We had this dinner um, after the, the massacre in Christchurch and to reach out to different forms of, um, to, of community to show that we, we're trying to continue to common and stay open through, the, through circles of sharing. So that's it for me, a very quick whiz bang through Wellington and our practice here, thanks. I'll stop sharing, how do I do that now? <laughs> Thank you, Sophie. Sure. It's great to um, see those projects and uh, I'd just like to invite Devisi to, um, whoop, <laughs> we see all your um, there we secret are. information on your screen. <laughs> Um, which does actually it does strike me that there's something interesting about the way that every single person uh, watching this is probably seeing something slightly different. You can see the video. We couldn't, um, you know, it's, it's, it's a strange sense yeah. of shared, but yeah. not quite shared. And you're never really, really certain. So I have a little um, earring that I put over the camera to um, hide myself <laughs> just in case on occasions. Um, anyway, um, Devisi, are you um, with us? Yes. Yeah, I'm, I'm here. Yes. Yep. Um, so thank you very much, uh, the three speakers, um, three curators who are from three um, different countries. So we, we have seen uh, different perspectives and experience, you know, um, from uh, uh, Australia, uh, the Philippines uh, and New Zealand, um, including, you know, before the COVID-19 and also, you know, something which is uh, very important is during the COVID-19 and how you know all these uh, activities of art related activities should survive in its, in this kind of context um what i think is very important that um emily mentioned about uh, public space it, it's not only street you know um majority of us come from very uh, physical kind of dealing with the physical uh, elements in the city you know kind of design background we also always think of public space as um, you know, open space in the city, but actually um, one of the very important aspects of public space is social space, the space is where people meet, people come together, interact with each other. Um, and what is interesting in um, the, the three uh, curators have brought in, in, into uh, these presentations is the power of art, in which I think it's go beyond just um, creating um, a piece of art for the, um, the pleasure of, of different senses, but art that change society. So I have seen the, the you know, very much in, in all three works, um, they are not engaging with, with artists, but uh, the, the role of curator is also activist to bring um, all, all different ideas come together and, and um, engaging people and the aim is to to um, make the society forward to make people think to, to make people uh, interact and reflect into what's happening in um, in real life now so um, uh, I would like to be to to maybe ask uh, three of you because we have to draw you back into really the, the heart of, of our um, uh, uh, sessions which is about um, speculative perspective. Um, you are uh, three curators, so of course during COVID-19 there are lots of, you know, like lockdown and everything that you have done, especially, you know, curating and bringing people together and, and that's the main obstacle. You can't bring people together. Um, how is that happening and how you could uh, overcome that? And also not only about doing 19 and maybe beyond this, how this what we call the new normal that we have to going to, you know, we are creating or we are going to create or maybe, you know, for a long time we need to 
adapt to our new normal. What do you think as curators that um, how, how art could be part of this process and um, what are you respond to that and maybe what are any other ideas that you could um, uh, maybe hint for us for, for, um, in terms of your, your own activity. So maybe in this order, Emily, Andre and Sophie, please. Emily. Uh, thanks, Davisi. Um, well, for, yeah, as I mentioned, for the moment, we are doing the majority of our work, well, all of our work digitally and, and creating specific art commissions for the digital space. Um, they include really interesting things like um, a project by James Newen and Victoria Pham, which is about re um, repatriating um, a, a rain drum from Vietnam and, and creating an instrument that can be played online open source um, as well as doing some performances with that so like there's some there's some interesting way obviously there is some range of ways that we can still bring people together um, and and do that in a, this kind of virtual space but um, one of my artists the other day reminded me of that every so often she um, goes to the side of her laptop screen and just looks at how thin that um, that that physical screen truly is. You know, it's what three millimeters, um, and she thinks how strange it is that she's been kind of into this space, which has all of these dimensions, and as you said, Mark, are flattened at times in in so many ways, um, and then she looks very physically at at how flat and kind of T the tactility is, is, is so kind of limited. So, um, yeah, look, we are like everybody um, navigating it as best we can. But I, the thing that has struck me very deeply this week, I don't know why this week, um, is just how long it's going to be until we reach and while we navigate this um, different kind of actually quite difficult environment. It's going to take a really long time. It's going to be years of working in this way. And I don't know that we're, and there's a whole lot of debate, obviously all over the place about, are we going, are we trying to go back to what we had or are we moving forward into something else? Um, and yeah, but, but what has really landed with me very heavily this week is, is just that this is this, we are so, at the, we are barely crawling in terms of what, um, what work there is to do to, to re-understand, to re reimagine what is possible. Andre, are you, I think you're next. Yes, I'm here. Um, Thank you, Andre, so, yes. So, so, so one of the things that um, I've been doing is, is connecting with uh, artists and obviously everyone's on their computer or on their cell phones. So. So I've been kind of connecting with artists in, in a different way and not necessarily about their art practice, but it's about like, you know, commenting on their Instagram posts or their family photos and things like that. It's just like, it, it, it obviously it had some, some, some artists have stopped creating and have stopped, um, you know, working on, um, on, on art. And so, so the, the only way to communicate with them is, you know, is through their post or by sending them a message, a quick hi and a hello. Um, as I said before, Pineapple Lab has become a community um, and family for, for a lot of us. So so just a quick message uh, and just, you know, to make things personal as well, adds a little bit of, um, you know, comfort during, during these times of um, isolation. Um, for me personally, what's kind of been difficult, um, and, and like Emily is, is to is realizing that um, that this is going to be um, this is not you know not at all going to end tomorrow, um, and you know for for someone who's running an independent art space that started five years ago and that has put everything from your money from your resources is it, you know, it's when, when people say pivot, it's not that easy. You're kind of like left with just being frozen many times. Um, and so that's where I'm at at the moment. Um, 
but also making sure that you know you communicate these thoughts and feelings and you know you, you you're aware of where you are uh, mentally and emotionally I think is 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 important um, and so I think it's important to to also recognize that perhaps other artists are going through the same thing or other arts managers are going through the same thing and that it's okay to not create at the moment um, uh, and just kind of be there to listen to to um, to the needs of the artists if they should um, have a need um, Another thing that I do is I've, I've joined a, I've joined different communities online, um, you know, pretending to be an ant in an ant colony or, um, or like a, a midnight snack group where you post about your food during midnight and you exchange recipes. So just something to kind of like get you out of the rut, of the rut um, does help um, and connecting with other folks as well. Thanks, Andre. Sophie? Thank you. Um, look, I think it's a bit different for us in New Zealand because we have seriously just opened up uh, the, the, the city now and we are, everyone is trying to kind of get back to living as they were. So it, it's, it's early days, but um, I sense that there are many more people working from home uh, as opposed to working in the centre city. And I think the challenge will be for when, when we all get back to the city, whether perhaps there'll be enough audiences for traditional theatres or galleries. So I'm, I guess, propose that we really look at our community spaces in the suburbs, particularly in the places where people are living as, as potential sites for our public practice. And if at the moment we're not allowed to see each other, you know, except if they're in our, in our family group, um, then leaving traces for each other is, is a nice gesture. I mean, I know with, with this community hub here, we've, had vegetable drop-offs and people have left notes for each other um, alongside the vegetables when even if they can't see each other, they can note. And there's, yeah, there's also a potential for, for, for um, painting and, and leaving signs that we, we are there even if we're not there at the same time. Um, but I believe that, yeah, maybe a, considering post-COVID a, a series of distributed networks a dis yeah, distributed network of, of hubs or nodes um whereby where people are living where it feels safer for people to be in and, and re-examining community centers rather than the center town the central city um could be a way forward thank you sophie um um, I have maybe one question, maybe because I, I really am interested in the terms of, of um, this uh, particular session, which related to uh, speculative. So maybe this question goes directly to Emily. Um, you have mentioned about your project uh, Refuge, which uh, dealing with uh, several themes over the year, like flood, heat, pandemic, displacement. Um, related to pandemic, maybe you know you can maybe enlighten us a bit about you know your spec speculation about pandemic. How was that project going on, and how was useful actually during COVID nineteen, especially this one? Because I think you know when uh, when you're doing some project, you kind of putting the scenario, what if scenario, and, and that scenario is coming in the reality. So how that's actually happening and uh, how coincide and and you said you have prepared the community for that and how does it uh, uh, going on actually? Yeah, well, interestingly, I mean, I started without test just prior to them delivering the pandemic um, project, so I really caught the tail end of um, the research and then the delivery phase. Um, but the main challenge in, of, of kind of creating that series into uh, you know that event in 2018 was the knowledge that we there's no way we would bring people together which is the practice as we've all said of, of curators um uh if i had my time again and i said it at the time well if we're, we should be all just doing this digitally if if we're not supposed to come together um i think it's in it's it's curious to me that that instinct of letting go of what it means together was was so profound um, but 
anyway, um, there are other pieces from that year um, that um, were, were quite curious. You know, the time we spent with the Doherty Institute was the main takeout was all about washing hands. Um, and we did Madeline T um, Flynn and Tim Humphrey, who I know were part of this series as well, um, or part of the RMIT, RMIT's program at least, um, did create and, and are working on another work that is about a, a sort of AI um, um, sort of project who, who talks to you about um, what, while you are washing your hands, the, the work is installed in a bathroom. Um, and where they did do that in 2008 and when they're sort of continuing that project with the Science Gallery in Melbourne to do a next stage of it. Um, so there were interesting things like that. There were um, quite a few events looking at grief, which I think is quite relevant, um, especially for our sort of friends in the United States and, and other countries that are experiencing um, really, really challenging circumstances with the pandemic and, and also trying to reconcile with what collective grief actually means when when we're just looking at numbers and we don't and we don't have names and um, so there was those components. Um, there was also we did a bunch of um, Sheng, Li Sheng Lun, who did host our Refuge Live Talk series. Um, he's a really um, fantastic thinker um, in, ter in terms of game design. So he did a lot of work, um, some really great um, digital works, and then also. I guess on like on iPads, some interactive works, but also um, with uh, a group of people that kind of played out how quickly viruses can spread and gave them a very visceral sense of um, what contagion actually looks like. So, um, yeah, and then there was another project that, um, an audio project that Ellen Van Nieven developed that we did also um, share as part of the Refuge Live Talk series again, um, that, that delved deeper into some of the things that Sarah was mentioning at the start about the um, very long history of, um, I guess, in, at least in Australia, of um, uh, how health and um, disease has been used against Aboriginal people as well as, as part of a form of what she would call genocide, or they would call genocide, sorry. Um, so, and they, Ellen, um, Ellen developed a very, very profound piece of text called Titterfly that, that talked through the historical, um, yeah, uh, positions of, of, of the way that smallpox and other kinds of diseases have, have really wreaked havoc and, and quite a lot of devastation in Australia. So, um, yeah, there were, yeah, there were historical perspectives, emotional, um, practical, some were, some were fun. <laughs> um, but in hindsight, um, looking back on that program, and knowing what we know now about living through a pandemic, um, yeah, it, it is about digital uh, interaction, I think, for better or worse. Thank you, Emily. So, um, yeah, when it's come to digital, so actually, you know, um, in my background, in our profession, we, we usually really believe in the physical space, the real space, space that you actually engage all your senses. But when during pandemic that you have to lock yourself down into just four walls, um, luckily, you know, with windows or balcony, um, but then all the life and work, you know, happening in the digital forms, um, uh, especially arts, I, I think you curator and artist would feel really um, some kind of burden, isn't it? Because um, you engage with, with five senses and beyond. And suddenly everything had to just uh, reduce to eyes, uh, dominance and, and sounds. You, you cannot reach beyond other things like uh, movement, taste. Uh, you cannot share um, the ambience together with uh, a lot of people. And sometimes, you know, that, that um, lack of others is actually become a real, real problem, you know, because humans are social animals and then when, when you uh, confined to this kind of, of, of space, it's, you know, reduced you into, you know, sometimes, you know, you feel really um, depressed, you know, through this period. So, um, I think maybe, uh, Hilary, we can, maybe it's time to open up the floor to other participants. Thanks, Davisi. Um, yeah, yeah sure Thank you everyone for your incredible contributions um, tonight. 
there's lots of uh, thematics running through, I think, from Mark's talk right through to um, um, Sophie's at the end around power and public and private space and renegotiating authority from that kind of, from a whisper through to um, a, a, an internet connection, perhaps. There are a few questions here in the Q&A panel that I'll just throw to and open it up to anyone um, who was presenting tonight to comment on. Um, first up, we've got a question from Martin Brennan. COVID-19 is a year without public space and the Black Lives Matter movement has reclaimed space that we, were ne we never were supposed to occupy. What will 2021 be a year without or a year of reclaiming? Do any of the panelists have a comment they'd like to contribute to that question? And I think Jodie Haynes' question following, the notion of public space comes with conditions of power, of who can be included and who is excluded. Australia's positioning is dependent on imperial positioning and cartography. Speculatively moving forward, how do we rethink how Sorry, how do you think we can reimagine, redream, and recreate public spaces in differently in the future? I think those both of those questions resonate um, around the events that have occurred across the last um, few weeks combined with the pandemic. So the the death of George Floyd and the impact that that has had across globally. Um, creating different spaces and creating a space that um, has re allowed our Indigenous populations to certainly raise awareness of something that often goes unnoticed in public spaces by the general population. Um, Mark, will you? Yes, I, I can, I can um, start on that one, Fiona. I think I mean, I think there've been a couple of clues. Uh, if we take those two questions as more or less treading the same territory, but I'll respond to the second one first. Um, there are a number of clues and potential tactics, I think, and the things that have been discussed tonight. I mean, Emily talked very directly to this notion of um, speculative practice, uh, a speculative practice whose job it is to disperse power. And I think that's um, an important thing to hold in mind. And I guess there's also an ongoing discussion about co-presence, whether it's virtual or physical. Um, and certainly the physical co-presence um, in physical space sort of does seem to be one of the uh, undeniable dimensions of public space. So I think in that second question, you know, uh, you're absolutely right. The, the, the framing of public space, the notion of crown land, uh, cartographic surveys, et cetera, et cetera. I, I always think that, our role as designers of public spaces or agitators in public spaces, if you're an artist or curator, I suppose, is to take that co-presence um, and maybe explore it in a non-physical or non-bodily way, such that uh, you can create uh, within a given situation a certain amount of ambiguity. So the idea of taking the cartographic frame of land ownership and edges and boundaries and uh, introducing another idea um, in our work, it's often ecological, uh, that in some ways antagonises or troubles the certainty of that existing dominant um, uh, frame. So that the, the notion of co-presence becomes a conceptual thing as well as it becomes uh, a bodily thing. Where there's a dominant voice, there is another whisper, to use that word again, um, that sort of erodes that authority slowly over time. And just within that itch of that uncomfortable juxtaposition of two sets of ideas, you create a very small um, opportunity for another kind of occupation. And that can be physical, it can be permission, uh, it can be um, uh, an, another behaviour that I think opens up the public realm for more than one reading and more than one occupation. Thanks, Mark. And I guess that's the role created through design and art practice to, to create those spaces that, that um, provide that sort of uh, 
a co-constituted opportunity to reveal other stories that might be uncomfortable, um, but are critical and, and need to happen. Um, does anyone else want to comment on those questions from the panel? So I'm going to um, raise, I guess, an issue here too around the notion of public and private. It, it lends itself to these uh, imperial overrides of space, I guess. Um, increasingly, as we we're all in this together, but we're not the same. But one of the roles of one of the um, effects of neoliberalism means that lots of our public spaces are looking the same. Lots of our public spaces could be confused across a city is a city is a city. That's being a little provocative, I guess. However, um, it's interesting to hear Andre your position that many of your public, most of your public spaces are private. Equally, that's common in Melbourne as well. Um, Andre, I wonder if you can talk about ways that uh, you attempt to reclaim some of that private space. Is that a viable notion for artists in the Philippines? Um, for sure. Um, I think it starts with um, being open to um, collaboration and some sort of um, partnership. Um, we've done that with um, our murals. Um, a lot of our murals in our mural projects are, pri uh, are private walls. Um, and so it's just a matter of um, involving um, these private um, organizations or entities and, uh, and um, making them be part of the process or be part of the movement, so to speak. Um, with with fringe, we never really use the term sponsor. Uh, we we uh, when we approach a, a private company or an organization, uh, we we call them cultural partners, and so immediately th there is um, something at stake for them already, or they feel that they are um, somehow contributing um, to the greater good or to the cultivation um, and access to to art. Um, so it's it's really about how how you involve them and 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 kind of learning about um, you know doing your research and and kind of um, knowing about their ethos and what the company stands for um, and also be discerning you don't just want to um, you know you don't just want this space because it's a space but if if, if the company or or the or the, or the groups um, you know practices are against your um, your ethos as an organization, then let's move on and find another space. Thanks, Andre. Emily, I might just throw to you uh, to comment a little bit further. You talked about the role of um, art, of art within institutions to be a role of activism and um, challenging the structures of power that exist. My, a lot of people have touched on that this evening. Emily, in a, in a civic institution, I, I often reflect on this coming from an educational institution, how do we, what are the tactics that we can use as creative thinkers and creative practitioners to start questioning and um, unraveling some of these uh, power imbalances? Uh, I would, I mean, it's an ongoing experiment. Um, and so there's a range of tools, I guess, where I'm just, um, we're, we're at the beginning of, of applying. Um, I think the, perhaps the most crucial one for me is, is um, and it's maybe old, um, is, is positioning yourself with the right kind of um, uh, authorities and eldership and around you so that um, when I'm enacting a kind of um, agitation towards the system I've got those safety mechanisms for myself and for all the artists involved too so it's much you know it's pretty easy to say no to me <laughs> um, uh, and and it will always will be but it's much harder if I have really demonstrative long-term community support and and the kind of cultural authority that comes from deep listening so um, 
it's not easy, but that the, I, I feel like that's the work. Um, and uh, that that's the work that we're sort of starting on a range of fronts. Um, not that it hasn't been happening for some time, but I guess it's that continued attention towards those, um, yeah, what I would call governance um, areas that are not glamorous, largely are invisible, um, need to remain as such, are very one-on-one -on -one and very slow, but, but that actually um, protect everyone to do the right risky things. You know? Thanks, Emily. Sophie, just drawing um, across to you in terms of these kind of renegotiations of authority um, in New Zealand, can you speak a little bit about your experiences in renegotiating these public and private spaces and the, and the powers of authority that you come up against? Yeah, thanks, Fiona. Um, Actually, one of your questions, one of the questions that I've already answered on the Q and A, which might be useful for other people to look at as well, is that it, um, was about that we've we've actually open sourced all our kind of ABCs of approaching private property owners, which um, it yeah, and and there are some key tools that I kind of we've struck things like contracts, <laughs> and um, what I I guess I've come to terms with this idea that there's a for, for property owners, private property owners, obviously they they think they want money <laughs> for their sites, um, and but if they're not getting it, then you know they 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 they're looking for other. What are they looking for? What what I in Dunedin particularly we worked um, with property owners who understood this idea that the city needs to be re enlivened. So that was something both artists and the property owners got. Probably the property owners wanted money, but they understood there was a step before, which is about a re-enlivenment, and the artists wanted the space, but they could see that this was a yeah, a common goal. So I think there's something about finding, establishing relationships, um, and finding that boundary object with um, whether pri private or municipal holders of space um, that's useful. Yeah. I'm kind of. I was just also wanted to touch on based on on a question that Martin put us about Black Lives Matter and whether this will be a year of, of claim reclaiming or, or not reclaiming. Um, and because I think it's such a big question that we've all gone we went a bit silent on it. <laughs> um, but actually, um, I'm really noticing a heck of a lot of people now challenging, um, you know, statues in New Zealand now and. Um, we're I think we're really noticing that even those municipal powers who are supposedly in charge, a lot of them are working for still from home. <laughs> and a lot of them, they actually are not in the city to control the space. So that actually the city is a bit of a, a, a territory to be reclaimed. Um, and so I think it's hugely exciting and I think we will end up with a lot more. Uh, I think there's a lot more to be seen and unfolded this year. Yeah, and yeah, I hope that's useful. But the, essentially, the the thing about the Urban Dream Brokerage pro work is on. There's a link on the answered questions, which um, you can find the open source kind of kit. Thanks, Sophie. That's really uh, useful and generative, which is what we're hoping the presentation tonight uh, has offered forward. Um, I'll just finish with one more question, or it's more a comment maybe for Sarah. I'm not sure if she's still with us, given the time that she was um, tuning in from the US. But Sarah, you mentioned something about sanitation being a kind of invisible infrastructure. And I think a lot of what we're talking about are the invisible infrastructures of, of, of culture, of creativity, of design of our cities, um, sort of took my imagination away thinking about the invisible infrastructure and you everybody sort of touched on this digital framing as well and one of the one of the biggest issues I think that we perhaps didn't uh, get time to cover but maybe touch on very quickly Sarah is that the public spaces that the mines that produce the equipment that we're using tonight like it, it's not just the flattened screen that we're dealing with there's a whole invisible public space that isn't evident through the accessibility of the digital realm. Um, and you talked about AI and, and, and 
um, that kind of surveillance, that the increasing surveillance, which again comes from a different public space that it's being introduced to do something other. I think I'm going in circles now and I've lost track of my question. But the notion of invisible infrastructures is um, a really interesting kind of concept to be dealing with. Sarah, do you, could you speak a little bit more to what, that, what we might be able to do with invisible infrastructures to, I guess, have it to shift the way our future is directed? Yeah, um, I think that's a very interesting question. Um, I think in the past, the way that we've dealt with invisible infrastructure is we started thinking about this um, vertical space. So the idea of a section um, came about into our planning cities and so forth. Prior to that, it was always um, a, a plan um, when we're designing cities. But then um, when we started thinking about this invisible infrastructure, it could be as well um, transportation in many ways that we dig it underground and they become the fundamentals sort of what, um, um, you know, what we have um, in cities. It might be the case, I mean, it's hard to speculate um, what it might or imagine what it might be with this invisible infrastructure being IOTs and AIs coming into the public space. Um, it, it, you know, is it is it about the virtual space that we're living in, um, that this becomes um, sort of this invisible um, world um, that we live in? I mean, in this, even in this space, we're choosing what our reality becomes. I mean, I could choose this angle, but then if I twist it a little bit, you can see my bed. Um, and you can see a very different reality. So it's, it's almost like we, we, are, we have a little bit more of a control of what um, our realities might look like. So um, the invisible here, even in this setting, could be on the other side of what's happening in my camera. It could be a total chaos. Um, you never know, but um, I assure you that's not the case. But, you know, it might be that, that this is, you know, the case in so many, thing, um, in so many ways. Um, with the AI intervention and IOTs, I mean, there's this whole discussion now coming up with the 5G idea and what it means for us. By, by the 5G um, and speeding up the internet, do we, a lot of people are even questioning, do we even need um, offices anymore? Because everyone's going to be able to work from home. Um, not that I'm uh, totally supporting this idea. I, I do genuinely believe in this sort of collaboration between people that happens when you're walking even just around the space, even the university, when it switched half of the semester last, um, in, the, in, in my final semester, they switched after spring break completely virtually. And you can see the dynamics, how, how much they've changed. Um, and the interactions are not the same. I'm not going, I'm not gonna, I wasn't able to bump into someone and have an interesting conversation that broadens the spectrum of um, what I'm thinking. This all sort of interaction is going to be rethought in some way. Um, I generally hope that we don't end up going through that path of depending so much on the virtual space because it also blurs the line of where we divide um, our working hours. I mean, I'm working ridiculous hours now that we're working through this space. It's like, yep, I can call you at 4 a.m. or I can call you at 10 p.m. Um, it just, it really does flatten the time between people and the work-life balance becomes um, another issue as well. Thanks, Sarah. And I think, I think we're um, thinking the, the potential of it to increase the control over our lives rather mm -hmm. than the freedoms. And I think the inequity of distribution of, of um, digital platforms as well raises those issues. I think a, a really big, um, the potential for what can be could be read from either direction, from a positive or a negative. But as practitioners, I think our intentions are to reveal some of these invisible impacts of um, our existence in COVID-19 and hopefully uh, create, leave some marks of care for the future rather than um, the opposite. And, um, so I think, I think I'm a terrible timekeeper and I suspect that we are over time. Is that correct, Louisa? And Louisa might come and join us. Now, can I thank everybody on the panel? Can I thank everybody who attended? One of the experiences of presenting in this platform is that we don't hear the audience and we don't see the physical cues of the audience nodding or 
may be leaving because we've talked too long. <laughs> um, but thank you everyone for participating tonight. Thank you, Louisa and Hendrik, for the opportunity for us to uh, engage in this space. Thank you. Yes, <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much uh, to all the speakers for this very interesting and insightful uh, conversation. Uh, I, I hope uh, our audience also appreciated. I see one comment saying that actually the conversation was uh, very inspiring. And so um, actually the effort of this uh, series of webinars is to bring uh, uh, speakers from different uh, geographical locations and different perspectives uh, to enrich the discussion on public space uh, through a transdisciplinary perspective. Uh, so I, I think uh, we, we made it today with this amazing panel of speakers. I don't know if you want to say something, Hendrik, be before I announce the next webinar. No, fine. <laughs> Okay, so I just uh, want to announce uh, um, the next webinar that will take place, uh, as you know, next uh, Thursday. Um, it will be about uh, creating accessible and inclusive public spaces with four resilient communities. And so we will try to discuss about um, a just and equitable city. And I think we will also cover some of the issues that were raised during this discussion regarding the political meaning of public space and the right to the city and the civic power to reclaim public spaces for all. Uh, so thank you again. Uh, so we close now this uh, great webinar. Uh, thank you for joining us. See you next Thursday. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.